Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Peggy, for that prelude this morning. My name is Joe Farmer. I'm here to assist Pastor Steve Rath this morning as we get ready to worship together. We welcome everyone. If you're with us in person, I encourage you to fill out the connect cards so that we know that you're here. If you have concerns or joys, you can lift those, list those on the back. And certainly our prayer chain will lift each and every one of those up during the week. If you're joining us virtually, you can go online and sign in there so that we know that you are in attendance. Please stand and join with me in our call to worship. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Who love the peace, who bring good tidings, who love the salvation, and proclaim the God grace. God will judge among many peoples. Join together in our opening hymn, number 513 in the hymnal, the words will also be on the screen, Soldiers of Christ Arise. I now invite you to safely greet each other, and when we come back together, we'll have our ministry from our sanctuary choir.
If you'll be seated now, we'll hear from God is so good from our sanctuary choir. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, here we go again. You guys are going to get on to this. we got to be a little bit louder than that so they can hear us out there. You ready? Good morning. Good morning. There you go. You're all awake. That's great. So, well, um, Pastor Steve is going to do his sermon today on shoes. Now, have you ever heard a sermon on shoes before? No. That's just, you know, we're really kind of looking forward to that, that sermon. So, there's different kinds of shoes. What different kinds of shoes do you guys have? Look at these. Sparkly shoes, right? You wear those to church. Tennis shoes, do you run good in those? You run in those. Okay, what about cleats? Anybody have cleats? You have cleats? Okay, what do you use those for? Soccer. Soccer and football, baseball. Okay, so um, any of you girls wear high heels yet? You don't have any high heels? You wear those to church? Okay, so I have on a pair of shoes today that I don't normally wear to church. What are these called? Sandals. These are sandals. And the reason I wore these is because this is kind of like what the kind of shoe is that they wore back in the days of Jesus. They wore sandals. Now, I have to ask you, I have to first of all tell you that back then uh, in Israel, it was very hot, it was very dusty and dirty, and it was a lot of rocks, a lot of sharp rocks around. Now, they, they had two options. They could wear sandals or they could go barefoot. Now, which do you think would be better? 
the sandals would be better. And they have like really thick soles. See how thick? Look how thick those are. They have nice thick soles so the rocks wouldn't poke through, right? And yet they're open and when it's hot, your feet can breathe, okay? They don't really breathe like we breathe. They don't have lungs, but anyhow, we say they breathe. They get lots of air, okay? That sort of thing. So, so here's the thing. So Jesus and his disciples and his followers, they all wore sandals and they walked around a lot. Did they have cars? Did they even have bicycles? <coughs> no. They, they basically walked. Everywhere they went, they just walked. Okay, maybe now and then they could ride a donkey or they could ride a camel. You're right. But basically, they just walked a lot. So, he sent them out walking. And they were walking to go to the towns and the villages to tell all the people of the good news of Jesus. Now, I have a couple questions for you. Did Jesus say that we should love our friends but hate our enemies? Or did he say we should love everybody? We should love everybody, right? Did he say that we should always be mad and, and fight people, or should we love people? We should have peace, right? We should have peace. Okay. So, uh, Pastor Steve's been talking about the armor of God that we put on. And one of the things that the soldiers would wear, would they would wear, they would have shoes. They would have big sandals that they would wear to protect their feet. So, what we want to do is to say that when you walk and you're with your friends, you're with your family, this is an opportunity for you to have on the shoes of God, okay, as part of your armor, to spread the good news. So here's the thing. If you have something that's good news, let's say you just scored a really good goal in soccer, okay, or you hit a home run in baseball, okay, would you just go home and, like, not tell anybody about it? Or would you be excited that you did that? You'd be excited, right? And you would spread that news. You guess what I did? I hit a home run. What if you got a new puppy or a new kitten? Would you keep it a secret or would you go tell everybody? You would tell everybody, right? You would say, oh, guess what good news I have. So here's the thing, that when you have, it's not always easy to talk to your friends about Jesus and about the right things to do, but if you have that chance, You've got those shoes to be prepared that you can talk to your friends and your family about Jesus and how, how good it is to know about him. And you could even invite them to Sunday school. And you could even invite them to church. Would that be a good thing? Would you like to have some of your friends come here too? That would be good, wouldn't it? Okay. Okay. Can we say an echo prayer? So you can repeat after me. <laughs> He's already going to do it. <laughs> Thank you, God for bringing us here today. Thank you for the armor that you put on us so that we can share the love of Jesus and be prepared to make this a better world. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you can go to music first and then I'll see you in junior church. Thank you, boys and girls, and thank you, Ms. Cheryl, for that lesson today. Earlier this morning, our adult Sunday school classes were blessed uh, to be joined together for a very special presentation on behalf of the United Methodist Children's Home and some of the new initiatives that are a part of that very, very well-established and very, very um, beneficial part of our United Methodist Church's heritage. And so to give you a little bit more for those of you who couldn't attend, Sean Riley is here. Sean is the executive director of United Methodist Children Home Services. And he is going to just update us a little bit more on what they do and some opportunities that you and I can share in some missions giving to that very important work. Welcome, Sean. Thank you so much, and I'm uh, putting myself on a timer here. Um, good, morning. good morning. Thank you so much for having me uh, at your service this morning, and I want to thank uh, the Sunday schools that spent so much time with me earlier. And their very uh, wonderful questions and conversation. So UMCH Family Services, that, that is who the children's home is today. 
the United Methodist Children's Home that has been a part of our community here in Central Ohio since 1911, like so many organizations, has transitioned into what it has become today and very different than what it was in 1911. <clears throat> and the way that I, would, I describe it to folks is we used to be the children's home and we are now the children's homes. Whereas we were a campus of residential care that, that closed in 2010, we are now many uh, campuses and in many hundreds of homes across our community. So where we provided a home for children to stay on a campus and go to school and hopefully return to their community um, as soon as possible, we now have foster homes. We have dozens and dozens of foster homes across central Ohio and southwestern or, uh, yeah, western Ohio. Adoptive homes. We find homes for special needs children and get them adopted across Ohio. We go into homes to preserve them. We are in literally in a year, hundreds of homes where we spend time with the families and children, and our focus is trying to keep those families together so that they don't have to get removed and sent to a campus like our old children's home was. And then we're in dozens of schools trying to preserve those homes and those families, providing outpatient counseling, uh, psychiatric services, we have nurses and doctors and social workers and counselors who work with those folks all across there. And it sounds like someone is very excited about this conversation. <laughs> and I think he's cheering me along. Um, that's my guess. So it is true that we have transitioned from the campus of the children's home that people knew and loved so much for so many decades. But we've gone from um, 15 years ago serving two to 300 children very well on that campus and in our foster homes back then. Next year, we will serve between two and 3,000 children and their families across central and southern Ohio, as well as some across the rest of Ohio through our foster care program. I want to thank you all so much for uh, taking the time this morning to listen to me. We do have uh, a way that we partner with churches, and I think we've partnered with you all before, and that's called Five on the Fifth. On the, on the fifth Sunday, um, we ask for a donation of basically a cup of coffee, $5, to help us further that mission to open more offices, to buy more computers for our therapists who go out into the community to work with families and children, to pay for training of our staff in the most effective and efficient models available to us. So uh, I know that your church is entertaining that, and we truly thank you for thinking about that, and if you so choose, participating in that. Thanks again so much. Have a blessed morning. Thank you, Sean. Now let's prepare our hearts to go to the Lord in prayer. I encourage you to use the con uh, not connect card How about the prayer journal it has a list of many folks that we're praying for and those that have lost family members or friends those who are in assisted living and our missions and ministries and I just encourage you to post that somewhere where you'll see that and be able to lift those folks up every day. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. We'll conclude with the Lord's prayer. Let us pray. Good morning, Heavenly Father. We come to you this morning and we're so thankful to have this time to worship together in word and song and hear about the good things that are going on. 
Father, we pray special this morning for the UMCH family services. We certainly appreciate all the good work that they're doing. Father, we lift up all those folks that are in the need of the touch of your hand. Be with them and their caregivers. And Father, where we have a role, just let us know so we can help out. Lest we be remiss, Father, thank you for the many blessings that you've given us. And Father, to you we give the praise and the honor and the glory. Let us join together now in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please join now in our hymn of preparation, hymn number 393. Spirit of the Living God. Our scripture lesson today comes from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 15. I'll be reading from the New International Version. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Good morning, friends. It's good to be with you, and it's also good to have those of you who are watching our service this morning via our live stream. So glad that that technology allows us to be together. A few weeks ago, we began a series that I've entitled Suiting Up, looking at uh, a teaching series based upon uh, some encouragement and some admonitions of the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus and how it is they could continue to live as distinctive people, witnesses of Jesus Christ in the midst of a culture and a society that was anything but Christian. Two weeks ago, we began to look at each of the pieces of armor that Paul describes in this passage and how there's a spiritual component uh, that we can apply to each of those elements of what would have been 
a Roman soldier's armor. We looked at the belt of truth. And last week we looked at the breastplate of righteousness. Today we're going to look at the shoes of preparedness. The shoes of preparedness. I wonder, is there anybody in the congregation today who once owned a pair of Brooks Villanovas? Nobody. How about Saucony Bullet or Pace Setter shoes? Still, nobody. Okay, ladies, this one's for you. Have you ever sported a pair of Atonic Bell Bond 10Ks? Still, nobody. All of the shoes that I mentioned were popular running shoes of the 1970s. You probably don't have any of those still around anywhere. But if we flash forward just a few years, in the midst of what is the current debate in amateur sports about use of an athlete's name, image, and likeness, in 1984, there was a fresh-faced NBA star whose name was Michael Jordan. Have you heard of him? Oh, thank goodness. Um, and, of course, we remember Michael Jordan as, as this incredibly talented and gifted basketball player who could do something incredible with a basketball. Do you remember what it was? He could jump and dunk a basketball almost unlike anyone the league had ever seen. Now, there was a group of people out on the West Coast who wanted to capitalize on this man's talent, and it was a company named Nike. Have you heard of Nike? All right, we're, we're, we're going somewhere. Okay, good. They developed a shoe with Michael's image on it. And in 1985, you could buy these shoes called Air Jordans. Did anybody have a pair of Air Jordans? Ah, there's some folks in the crowd. You've got Air Jordans, Clayton? Very cool. In 1985, you could buy the first version of Michael's shoes for a, an exorbitant price of $85. Who bought shoes for that amount of money, right? It was unbelievable, and yet it's been a marketing machine now for decades. Now let me ask a different question. I know that's going to get even more hands. How many of you have ever put on a pair of combat boots? Mm -hmm. A few more. Well, you know if you've ever donned a pair of those boots, they're not exactly the latest fashion statement. You can shine them up, but you can't make them pretty. They're not meant to look good. They're simply meant to help you in a battle. They're made to allow you to keep standing when an enemy would come along and dare to trip you up. They're made to help you keep moving when the road gets rough. They're made to help you be ready whenever your commanding officer has an order for you to fulfill. And as we think about our life with God and developing the kind of character that comes with that, we are continually in a battle, as we've discussed, with an enemy that we cannot see. And yet, he is constantly doing his work in our midst. And today, we're going to look at the shoes of preparedness. What is it about the shoes, in a spiritual sense, that allows you and me to be victorious in the battle of our souls? Now, a Roman soldier's shoes, as we heard a little bit earlier with the children, weren't really boots. They were more like a souped-up pair of sandals made out of very thick soles with hobnails or bits of rock attached on the bottom sort of much like a modern-day pair of cleats that you might wear. Several very thick leather straps tie the shoes onto the soldier's feet. And you know what happens every time you go buy a pair of shoes, what's the first thing you have to do with them? You have to break them in, right? 
They get very, very uncomfortable until you've worn them enough and your feet uh, mold to them and then you can wear them much more comfortably. Same thing is true with a Roman's soldier's footwear. Paul says that as we look at this armor of God, it means that we have our feet fitted with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We have our feet fitted with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel of Jesus Christ that gives us peace. And in this gospel, we can have peace with God. With this gospel, we can have peace with God. Earlier in his letter to the Ephesians, Paul says, You were once far off, strangers, aliens of any knowledge of this gospel of Jesus Christ. But you've heard it. Some of you have become its latest ambassadors. You have been brought near, invited, drawn to, welcomed by the blood of Jesus Christ. For he himself, Paul says, is our peace. And through this gospel, Paul says, our hearts, which we talked about last week, we must guard with all diligence can have peace. Jesus spoke of this gift often in his ministry. As he reassured his disciples at the coming of the Holy Spirit, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let them be afraid. This peace, this peace that Jesus comes to be and to bring is ours through God's grace and our faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, we don't always live in peace, but it's always available to us because it's found in the good news of the gospel. And while we're living in that peace, there is an enemy that wants to distract us, wants to dissuade us, wants to take our eyes off Jesus. In a manner of speaking, he wants to trip us up. He wants to cripple us. Because the devil knows that if he can rob you of your peace, then you've experienced defeat. But when we keep our feet prepared, we're able to cling to the gospel of peace and stand against, stand against the distraction and the untruth of the enemy. And as we think about putting those gospel shoes on, the first thing Paul says that we must do is that we must stand. We must stand. It's embarrassing to stumble. And goodness knows I've done it more than once in my life. Have you ever done it? And done it in a really, really embarrassing situation? It wouldn't be funny at all for a Roman soldier, though, to stumble. Keeping our footing is essential if we're going to be strong in a battle. Not many soldiers can fall and keep fighting. And when your enemy comes along and trips you up, what happens? You're pretty much at that enemy's mercy. Therefore, we have to keep standing in order to be victorious and win the fight. This gospel of peace that Paul reminds the Ephesians of keeps us standing. And as it does, we can become confident because we've been accepted by the blood of Jesus Christ. We stand in his righteousness alone. We stand in his righteous, righteousness alone, assured of his acceptance and his love for us, that no matter what the enemy would dare to say about you or me, we are God's beloved children. Now Paul talks about this theme of peace throughout many of his letters. And in the fifth chapter of the letter to the Romans, he says that having been justified by faith, 
Listen to what he says next. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, whom we also have access to by faith, into which grace we do what? We stand. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by faith in the grace in which we stand. The enemy does so much to want to trip you up, to make you doubt God's grace for you, to think that you're too good to need it or too bad to receive it. He either feeds your pride and says, you know what? I've got this God thing all figured out. God and I are just fine. Or you know what? I've done so many terrible, horrible things and feel so much shame that I never believed God would ever accept me. The enemy wants you to focus on your feelings and your emotions instead of God's character, God's word, and the truth of his promises. The gospel of peace gives us confidence, not in ourselves, but in God, who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. When the devil dares to come to attack you and me with guilt and doubt, and condemnation, they're some of his favorite weapons. The gospel of peace keeps you standing firm in Christ's righteousness. But it not only helps you stand, it helps you keep moving. It helps you keep moving. I don't know about you, but about a year ago, I went shopping for a new pair of shoes. I'm a guy. How hard can a new, buying a new pair of shoes for a guy be? I'm a size 9, and I take just a regular width shoe. Let's say you go to Kohl's, and you get to the shoe department. My gosh, they got boxes and boxes of shoes. Sizes, shapes, colors, brands, styles. All I want is just a regular, plain old man's size nine shoe. I can get running shoes. I can get walking shoes. I can get shoes with extra reinforcement in the toe. I can get shoes that will provide non-slip reinforcement. So if I work on a job that I might uh, fall easily, well, that'll keep me standing firm. But you know what? I couldn't find a particular brand of shoes. I couldn't find a regular size nine, man, I'm just standing around doing nothing kind of shoe. <laughs> Anybody ever seen those kind of shoes? They don't make them. Because our feet are made for standing strong and our feet are made for moving. They don't sell shoes. I'm just standing here doing nothing. Where are those shoes? Uh-uh. In the same way, our spiritual shoes are made to walk through this world of all kinds of things that would dare trip you and me up. Toils and snares, the old hymn says, but we have this gospel of peace to protect us. It keeps you going, keeps you moving when the road of your life gets rough and assures you that as you keep moving, God is with you. God is with you. In Hebrews 13, 5, it says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And this verse connects three very important things. Covetousness, the desire for more than what you have, the contentment, a peace with what you already have, and a reminder of the presence of God who walks with you through the whole journey. Now, that doesn't mean you and I don't have needs. We all have needs. But the writer of Hebrews says, 
the important reminder is that we always turn to the one who supplies all of our needs. It doesn't mean there aren't things that you want. It doesn't mean there aren't things that you wish for. It just means that in Christ, who is always with us, we will always have everything we need for this journey. The gospel of peace is the peace of what it's like to sail in a storm-tossed boat without sinking because the master of the sea is in the boat with you. He can calm the seas, but more importantly, he's already calmed your heart. It's about being content in Jesus Christ. It's at the heart of Paul's teaching in Philippians 4 when he writes to, to that church, I'm not saying this because I am in need. I'm saying this because I've learned to be content whatever my circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether I'm well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. You probably know the next verse. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. What's Paul talking about here? He's reminding, of, he's reminding you and me that this peace is only possible through the very presence of God. Only because we know that he walks with us. That's why the enemy is so intent on often wanting to thwart your circumstances. It's not hard to be at peace when everything around us and in us is peaceful. But the minute things get crazy or chaotic, the devil begins to make you panic. Oh my gosh, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? What, what, do I, what, what should I do next? And he begins to paralyze us, often in our thoughts, with things like fear and unbelief. He wants to take your eyes off Jesus and put them on him and upon your circumstances. But the gospel of peace keeps you and me walking with God, no matter how ragged or rugged the road before us gets. During World War I, a British commander was leading his men back to battle. It was a cold, rainy, muddy day. And one by one, as they marched along in formation, you couldn't help but notice their shoulders sagging because they knew what lay ahead. They knew that muddy conditions and blood and death were about to ensue. And as you're preparing to do something like that, you don't exactly have the, the highest of morale. Nobody sang, nobody talked, and as they marched along, they came alongside a bombed out church. And through the rubble, the keen eyed commander spotted the figure of Jesus Christ on the cross. And he remembered the one who'd suffered and died and rose again for his faith. And, and as his troops got closer and they marched past, he, he shouted a command he never used before. Eyes right, march. Every eye turned to the right and the soldiers marched by. And as they did, they saw that image of Christ on the cross. They began to see triumph in the midst of suffering. Miraculously, their shoulders began to straighten and lift, and smiles began to cross each one of their faces one by one. The gospel of peace prepares you and me to keep moving because Christ himself is leading the way. The gospel of peace prepares you and I to keep standing, to keep moving, and to keep delivering the message of the good news of Jesus. To keep delivering the good news of Jesus. 
because a Roman soldier's boots were so light, it, all, it made him not, easy, not just easy to stand, but also able to run at a moment's notice. Anyone who were students of the Old Testament in Paul's day would immediately recognize the verse in Isaiah 52 that you read earlier. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring glad tidings of good things, who proclaim salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Isaiah is not talking about how beautiful your feet look when you haven't had a pedicure in weeks, ladies. He's talking about the joy of bringing the gospel of peace to all of those who have never heard it. That's the joy of the gospel of peace. And Satan wants to keep that news as hush-hush as he can. But the gospel of peace, properly worn and taken on, allows you and I to faithfully deliver the message of Jesus Christ to anyone, anytime, and any part of the world. It means that you and I are always about the business of making disciples of Jesus Christ. And there are so many ways to do it. Perhaps you're a mother who reads the Bible and prays with her kids often. Perhaps you're a grandparent who brings your grandchildren to church because mom and dad can't or won't go. Maybe you're sharing the gospel with a coworker going through a hard time who just needs the kind of encouragement that your friendship, that your relationship, and your presence brings to them. Some of you do it teaching Sunday schools or or teaching a class, or, or lay speaking, or just offering support and prayer to those going through a difficult time. Anytime you point people to Jesus Christ and direct them to his word, you are sharing the gospel. You are sharing the gospel. And you and I, friends, have been entrusted with this message with this gospel of peace. And if we're not delivering the message each and every day, we are failing our Savior. Pastor George Sweeting once told of a man who named, named John Currier who was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison in 1949. In 1968, Currier's sentence was terminated and a letter bearing the good news was sent to him. But, but, the letter was never delivered. Imagine that. Ten years later, a state parole officer learned about Currier's conviction and termination, found him and told him that his sentence had been taken up. He was a free man. Can you imagine someone writing a letter freeing you and you never received it until 10 years later? Oh my goodness. What it, would it matter to you if someone sent you an important message, the most important message of your life, and year after year that urgent message was never delivered? Oh my. The gospel of peace isn't just for those who hear it and believe it, but it's meant for those who share it. And that's why Paul says you and I must fit ourselves with the armor of God, with the shoes that prepare us to receive the good news of Jesus' peace. And there are some of you perhaps today who feel like, you know what, I've gone just about as far as I can go on this journey. I'm tired. I'm worn out. I don't know that I can take another step. Perhaps you feel abandoned and you don't see any hope on the horizon. You just feel like the day gets longer and the road gets darker. But we must keep trusting 
in the one who reminds us that he is our peace, who leads us and will help you and I finish the race that we've started. But we must keep moving with the gospel of peace. We have a message of Jesus Christ that he's depending on us to be sure gets through. It's not easy sometimes. But how can we be at peace knowing that some people will never know this peace unless we deliver the message. So friends, today it's time for us to think about what it's like to dig in our heels and prepare for duty. It's time for us to put on the shoes of the gospel of peace, to stand firm, tall, to march onward, and to remember that we always have a mission and a message too urgent to ever ignore. Let's pray. Lord, each and every day, probably more than once, but at least once, each and every one of us puts on a pair of shoes. Maybe they're our favorite pair of shoes, the, the pair of shoes that are most comfortable to our feet. And we enjoy them. Maybe on other occasions, Lord, we, we pull out a particular pair of shoes for a special occasion that go with an outfit that we might be wearing. But nonetheless, today, Lord, thank you for reminding us that our shoes our gospel shoes are important for the witness of our work as disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Help us rem remember each day that as we get dressed, we don't just forget to put on these shoes either. And as we go about your work, as we go about the gift of the days that you give us, help us keep watch to stand strong, to stand firm, to keep moving when it's time to move, and to always be ready to share the good news of the gospel. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, in that spirit, I'm going to invite you to stand as you're able and join in singing verses 1, 2, and 5 of Onward Christian Soldiers, number 575 in your hymnal or on the screen ahead.
Amen. You can be seated. I'm going to offer just a couple of announcements as uh, we prepare to conclude worship for today. And then we also have a special announcement that we want to offer to you as well. A reminder that tomorrow, May 23rd, is the deadline for uh, newsletter articles. So for those of you who are leaders of various ministries, teams, and committees, if you haven't already done so, get that to Trista and the church office so we can include uh, your ministry and information uh, in next month's newsletter. In your bulletin, you'll also find an insert. It's time for the annual yard sale, and there are dates and times and ways that you can help and be a part of uh, this fundraiser. That's a part of our mission and our ministry, so take note of that as well. All right, I'm going to invite Diane Miller to come. She's the chair of our Staff Parish Relations Committee, and she has a very important announcement about some of the work that they have been uh, doing this week. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, first off, uh, a lot of you have offered up your support, your guidance, your counsel uh, to me, to the SPRC. Uh, that, that counsel and that guidance is invaluable to me. I appreciate it uh, more than you'll ever know. So many of you know that a new pastor was going to be assigned to our church for quite some time. You have had questions and you have trusted the process. I'm pleased to let you know that the conference has indeed assigned a new appointment. And this past Thursday, the SPRC had the pleasure of meeting our new pastor and his wife. Uh, while they were there, while they were here in the building, uh, they toured the facility as well as the parsonage. With that, I'm pleased to announce that our new pastor is Reverend Mike Ray Foltz, and he brings with us his wife, Bonnie. Mike has been a pastor for over 30 years and joins us from a three-point charge that includes Leru UMC. He and Bonnie are both from Wapakoneta, Ohio, and have been married for almost two years. They have a combined family of four adult sons and two adult daughters, as well as nine lovely grandchildren, all of which are spread across the, the globe, and I'll let him elaborate on that. It's a wonderful story. Uh, Bonnie, his wife, works for Hilton in sales, and most importantly, they have a corgi named Marley. So throughout this season of transition and change, I would like all of you to focus forward on some very important things within our church family. Assume positive intent in words, actions, and deeds. Focus on the mission of the church. Unconditionally love, support, and respect one another. Stand together as brothers and sisters in Christ by building and rebuilding trusting relationships. And finally, be willing to grasp the ring of service to our congregation, our community, and to our God. So Pastor Mike's first day in the pulpit will be June 26th and will be followed by a carry-in dinner in the Family Life Center. I know all of you will welcome Pastor Mike and his wife, Bonnie, into our church family and look forward to meeting him soon. Thank you. Thank you to Diane and our staff parish relations for that very important work and sharing those words with all of you. As we go forth this day, friends, I send you once again in the grace and the peace of Jesus Christ. In the name of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit that leads, guides, and keeps all of us. Amen. Thank you.